All right, I think we are ready to begin our presentation. I just want to do a quick intro. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. Okay. Let's go. Um, my name is Dustin Powers, and I am president of Innovative Computer Services. Today, I brought with me two of my smartest technicians, Robbie Kessner and Zach Harless. And I think. I'm sorry, I didn't forget these <laughs> names. Sorry. So welcome to our uh, weekly noon knowledge session. Today's session is about uh, moving your business to the cloud. And with us is Dustin Powers, who is the owner of um, Innovative, Computer, Innovative Services. Computer Services. I'm not great with names. And Robbie Kessner and Zach Harless. And uh, folks don't realize, but the internet has changed the way people do business to the point that if you don't know much about the cloud, it's time to start learning. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our oh, thank you. All right. So like I said, I'm president of Innovative Computer Services, and uh, I actually started Innovative Computer Services 16 years ago. We are uh, an IT firm. We have an office in Chilhowee, but we actually cover a very large area. And we deal mainly with small to medium-sized businesses. We provide full IT services, so we we set up desktops, install software, manage firewalls, manage networks, manage Wi-Fi. And um, as part of that, we do a lot of technology planning with our customers. So each year we sit down and talk about purchases they may need to make in the next year or so. And something I hear quite often now when I talk to customers is how can we utilize the cloud? Uh, if we're talking about buying a new server, buying new parts for a network, how does that integrate with the cloud, or should we be talking about the cloud instead of the server? So I think that's a really good question. And, and the first question is, what is the cloud? And a lot of people have different answers to that. I think if you ask any IT person what is the cloud, they would probably give you a different answer. So coming up with this PowerPoint, I actually spent some time playing on the internet, of course, and I found a few videos. The first video is funny. It's not serious. It's a fake news video. It talks about HP moving into the cloud a few years ago. But I think it highlights some of the kind of the mystery of the cloud. So I'm going to start with that, and then we'll move on to the more serious stuff. Hewlett Packard is known for their basic, affordable, no frills computers. But that doesn't mean they can't keep up with the latest technology. In a press release yesterday, HP said, quote, we are excited to begin offering that cloud thing that everyone is talking about. We definitely have the cloud on our computers, and it is better than anyone else's cloud. Earlier today, I sat down with HP spokesman Gary Klinman, who said the company couldn't wait to show people, quote, how they do their cloud stuff. We are absolutely thrilled that uh, now uh, people with computers or, or, or phones, both, both, uh, will now be able to, um, uh, back things up to the cloud, and yes, and that is definitely uh, that's definitely something that people do, and they will be doing it with HP. HP is making their cloud technology the centerpiece of a major new print and television ad campaign. HP is the company I've always relied on. So when I decided to get on my computer on the cloud, which is how you do it, naturally HP was the company I chose. HP's cloud is the perfect tool for emails, Facebooks, texting, and CD-ROMs. How does the cloud work? so simple and intuitive, I don't need to waste your time explaining it. Clinton says it isn't surprising they're, quote, up on the cloud, considering they're on the cutting edge of all the latest tech trends. Now, are there any additional features? Crowdsourcing is something we are having. Crowdsourcing 2.0. We have a, a social sharing. We have a 4G, 5G, 6G, really all the Gs. We have app. We have all of it in the computer. Despite all of their wide array of technology, HP says they're most excited about the cloud. They even let me take a peek at their design laboratory, where HP engineers were trying out some unique development techniques. So, how much capacity will HP's cloud users have access to? 1,000. We'll be watching to see if HP's cloud push pays off. Make sure to catch the next tech trends when we'll be looking at body do. Okay, so of course that was a joke. But I think it highlights that a lot of people um, know what the cloud is, and that's a lot of different opinions on the cloud. For me, as an IT consultant, when I think about the cloud, 
I think of any time that you are accessing data or applications outside your office. If it's, a, if it's a file that's on your server at your office, on your computer, then it's local. But if you're accessing something outside your office, then I think you're in the cloud at that point. The most common thing, of course, is email. We all use email, and most likely that's in the cloud. You're checking your email through your internet provider or through maybe a free service like Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, or possibly you're paying for email access through uh, a provider like Microsoft or our company. We host email. But either way, when you're doing that, it's in the cloud. Now, you may download your messages to your computer and delete them from the server, and at that point it's local, but for some time there, your, your information was in the cloud. The other big thing is sharing files. Um, we're gonna talk more about that later, uh, the best way a business can do it, but a lot of people share files, and the most common thing I can think of is Dropbox. I've used Dropbox for years. I believe it was the most mainstream thing that people saw in the beginning as a way to share files. Um, I'm actually the chairperson of a nonprofit here in town that helps cancer patients, and we started using Dropbox a couple of years ago to be a cost-effective way to share files with board members and volunteers. Uh, we stay under the storage limit that they get for free accounts, so we don't pay anything. I've never had an issue explaining to a board member or volunteer how to access the files, so it's simple to use. So those two things, I believe, pretty much make it, makes everyone in this room already in the cloud. Now I did find another video that's more serious and I think the thing I liked about this video that I found, it kind of talks about how industry and business changed 100 years ago and now it's changing again with the IT industry. What is cloud computing? Cloud computing is a revolution in how computing power is delivered to business. It's been made possible by very large-scale data centers connected to high-speed, low-cost broadband networks. Today's users require 24-7 secure access to more business apps on more devices wherever they are. Demands on IT are skyrocketing. It's no wonder traditional on-site computer facilities are struggling to keep up. With cloud computing, you only pay for what you use. Gone are the traditional IT bottlenecks, which means no more waiting. Gone are computer rooms full of servers and data storage, firewalls and routers along with the team to support it. Gone is the need to constantly invest in upgrades and rebuilds. Instead, by plugging your blue cable into the wall, you access exactly what your business needs, including all the support and expertise paid for as a service. History reveals a similar shift happened in the way business used power at the turn of the century. In the late 1890s, every factory or business had in its basement a smoke belching, fuel consuming power generator, stoked by grey boiler suited men who serviced it and kept it running as best they could. When things worked, they worked nicely. But when they didn't, which was quite often, the machines ground to a halt, the lights went out and nothing got done. Chicago 1900. The Edison Power Company developed the turbine power station, which could generate and distribute large-scale power to business. This provided cheaper, more reliable and cleaner power than any factory or business-based generator without many of the headaches. By 1920, most businesses had made the switch. Business now access power simply by plugging into the wall. In-house power generation no longer made sense. Today, we take virtually unlimited power for granted. We can't imagine it any other way. As we speak, a similar revolution is happening in IT, called cloud computing. Business no longer has to... ...all its users, wherever they are, on whatever device they use. This is called Infrastructure as a Service, IAAS for short. Your applications remain the same, but running on more reliable cloud infrastructure. 
this is where most businesses will start to use cloud. Apps will be migrated as existing in-house infrastructure reaches the end of its life. IAAS is the power station at the core of all cloud models. PAAS, or Platform as a Service, builds on the power of IAAS as a platform to make it easier to collaborate and develop software. SAAS, or Software as a Service, is the icing on the cake. Fully serviced software running on fully serviced infrastructure. Gone are upfront investments for new business application packages. So, cloud can be all three models with IAAS at the core. As demands on your in-house IT go through the roof, contact Macquarie Telecom and take it. So, that threw out some big terms and it was probably more based for bigger businesses. Like I said at the beginning, we deal with a lot of small businesses. So when I was coming up with this PowerPoint, I was trying to think of the best way um, that the small businesses we deal with, the, the things they take advantage of or could take advantage of. And I narrowed that down into four categories. The first were phone systems. The second would be email, that probably everybody has, but maybe there's a better way to do it. Third would be file storage. And fourth would be software as a service. And then we'll wrap it all up and talk about how to make it secure. So my first topic today is phone systems. I have sold phone systems from the beginning of my business. In the beginning, you usually had a closet somewhere in a business that had a small box that was the phone system and it had all kinds of cords plugging into it. Some of these cords were the phone lines coming in from, from providers like CenturyLink or Comcast or BBU, and every one of those cords was a phone number. Um, to kind of illustrate this, I'm going to use my business some, and our phone number is 646-2570. So in the beginning of my business, I had this box in the office, and one of those lines coming in was 646-2570. As my business grew, I needed more outside lines coming in, and I needed to be able to make calls while people were calling in at the same time. So I added more phone lines. Now, my customers didn't really know those because they just rolled over, but I had to pay CenturyLink for every time I added a line. Well, kind of like the traditional phone systems, it is two parts. You have to have a provider, and you have to have a phone system. The provider has changed though. The provider provides something called SIP, S-I-P, and that's the standard language that these providers use to talk to a voice over IP phone system. And um, with the SIP providers, there's so much flexibility and there's so much cost savings. You no longer think about the number of phone lines you have. So when I switched my company to SIP, I ported over our 646-2570 number and that's it. I didn't port over all those back lines that I had. Because with SIP, you can have unlimited phone calls going on at one time with one number. It's not tied to just having multitudes of phone lines. So the best way I can explain that would be, you know, we have four phones in our office. Uh, we have one phone number. Three people could call our 646-2570, and three phones will ring in our office. We can pick them up, talk to people. That fourth phone, somebody can walk it, to it pick it up, dial out, it shows 646-2570. We're only paying for one phone line through our SIP provider. So in most cases, there's a huge cost savings to this. And it really depends on the number of phone lines you have. We went to some businesses that maybe have 10, 12 phone lines, and we've been able to put them on a small business SIP package, and their phone bills went from 500 bucks a month to $199 a month for the service. The other thing is you have so many options, you can generate multiple numbers through these SIP providers, and they usually charge a couple of bucks a month for a number. So the way we would use that at some offices is we might generate a number that goes to a billing department, a number that goes to the office manager, and we can route those calls directly to that individual without having to pay a lot of money to a, a, a CenturyLink or someone like that for a standard phone line. The other part is you still have to have a phone system for that SIP provider to connect to. I'm going to show you in a second the one we sell, which is called Karyo Operator, but there's a lot of voice over IP phone systems out on the market. The thing about these is they can either be hosted or they can be a hardware appliance. And by that I mean we could sell a hardware appliance for our operator phone system and it would still sit in the closet back in the building somewhere of your, of your office. And I would kind of call that like a hybrid cloud. You still have your phone system in your office, but you're using a SIP provider out in the cloud. 
The other option is we can host your phone system in our data center. So at that point, it's all cloud-based. Your phone system is hosted out on the internet. Your phone service is through a SIP provider. I kind of prefer the hosted option because we handle all the upgrades to the phone system, and we also handle any hardware, fa hardware failures of the phone system. So up front, you would pay more for the hardware appliance, but in the long run, the hosted option, we take care of all the maintenance. And that's the same with most of the companies that do VoIP systems. The really neat thing about a VoIP system is the phones can be located anywhere. And this is where it gets to be so true cost savings for companies. So if you think about our office, we have four phones. They're all programmed to go through our hosted phone system. Well, once these phones are programmed, I could unplug my phone at my desk, I could go home, and I could plug it into my router. And once it registers, it shows my extension number, my name. Robbie could dial my extension from the office, and it will ring my phone at home, and I could pick it up and talk to him, just like we're sitting next to each other in the office. Somebody could dial our outside number, the 646-2570, and it'll ring my phone at home and I can answer it. And the person from the outside has no idea. They think they just called my office and I'm sitting in my office. The other neat thing is there's mobile apps for most of these phone systems that you can put on your phone. So the way that would work is if I open my mobile app for my operator phone system and Robbie calls my extension, it'll pop up on my phone if I'm out at a client's office somewhere and say I have an incoming call from Robbie and I can answer it and I can talk to him because he dialed my extension. He could also transfer a call to me from the outside. So they've called our main number. He's answered it at my office, but he's transferred it to my phone. Not my cell phone number, but to my phone through this app. The other benefit is if I call a customer from my phone, if I do it through the app, it shows that I'm calling from my office. And I've got a really good example I can keep thinking of every time I talk to a business about this. In 2015, we had some bad weather. We had winter storms, and the roof on our house was damaged. So I'm friends with my insurance agent, and I called him on Monday, and I said, hey, we had this damage. And he said, okay, I'm going to have our adjuster call you. Well, during the day, I get all kinds of phone calls from random numbers, and I typically don't answer them if I don't recognize them because I'm out at somebody's business somewhere working on a computer. Well, I got a couple of calls one day from a 540 number, and I didn't answer it. And a couple of hours later, my insurance agent emailed me, and he said, hey, buddy, my agent or my adjuster is trying to call you, and he says you're not answering your phone. Well, if my insurance company had this type of phone system that I'm talking about, when the adjuster called me through the app, it would have looked like he was calling me from the, the home office. So I would have answered it, probably thinking it was my friend, the insurance agent, when it was the adjuster out at my house. And I would have just assumed he was sitting at the office somewhere. So from a business perspective, I think it really adds to your brand. Everything's coming through your main phone number. It's showing up as you on the caller ID. And that adds some accountability, too, in that scenario because... If he had been using our phone system, I could easily pull up a report in the phone system and say, yeah, so-and-so called you through our phone system at a certain time. If you're calling from your cell phone in a business environment or using personal phones, it's kind of hard to track that information. So the system that we sell, like I said, is called Carrier Operator. And pretty much all this I've already went over. It helps you stay connected to your customers. That is what the hardware appliance looks like. That little box is the phone system itself. Um, it's very affordable, but it gives us all kinds of enterprise options like uh, call routing, uh, auto attendance, groups. There's so many features that it has. And our options, we could either rent you the phones per month or you could buy the phone system itself. Um, if you rent it, it's all lumped into one monthly fee. And the neat thing, in a lot of businesses we go to, if they have the right number of phone lines that they're paying CenturyLink or Comcast right now, we can put them on a SIP provider. We can give them a new phone system, and we can lump it all into one monthly fee that's cheaper than they're paying right now. So I have a quick little video here from Cario, just highlighting some of their product. The majority of SMB IT integrators out there today are familiar with what? A lot of them, however, tend to shy away from it purely because they believe it to be a complex and convoluted new technology. Integrators are too busy these days to dedicate the time and resources they believe is needed to play in the web space. But let's think about this a little bit more. There isn't a lot of difference between the way phone calls and emails are transmitted when we break it down to its true essence. One of the great things about VoIP communication is that it uses the internet. So I could make a phone call overseas, for example, and I don't have to worry about how many minutes I'm using or how much the phone call is going to cost. And it doesn't mean that I have to stay tied to my office desk either. I can install a soft phone application on my mobile device, configure it with carrier operator, and start making phone calls. Uh, the sound quality is great, 
and I don't have to worry about how many minutes I'm using or how much that phone call is going to cost. Well, one thing that's great about the uh, Cario operator is the my phone interface where through a web browser I can dial phone numbers so I don't have to actually key in on my phone uh, where I might be prone to misdialing or fat fingering a certain number and calling the wrong person. Also, I do a lot of work within Salesforce and I need to contact certain people. And it's great just to look up their contact info and then copy and paste into my phone and just dial their number. It'll dial my phone and then when I pick that up, it'll immediately dial to the other party so I don't have to worry about manually keying it in myself. Well, Cario Operator's automated attendant basically answers all inbound phone calls and then routes them with a menu system to the appropriate extension or voicemail or call queue. And the great thing about that is that I don't have to manage it with a handset and a keypad on a phone. I actually get to manage it through a browser, which means I can do it from anywhere in the world. And it provides a really clear visual map of how I'm creating my menus. One of the features of Cario Operator is voicemail and email integration. Uh, and the fact that when I'm not at my desk and somebody leaves a message for me, that gets forwarded to my inbox. Uh, one of the other great things about how Cario Operator integrates with our other product, Cario Connect, is that if I mark that message as read, uh, it'll mark it as read within the voicemail system. Uh, or if I delete the message from my inbox, it's actually going to delete it within Cario Operator. Well, Cario Operator does such a great job of incorporating a lot of really smart features but still keeping it easy to use for the administrator and for the user. It gives small businesses the ability to manage a cost-effective phone system that sounds like an enterprise PBX. Features like call queues and conference rooms and ring groups, these are all features that help large corporations communicate. And with Cario Operator, these features are now manageable in the hands of the small business community. And of course, it comes with all the system health and reporting features that administrators love about Cario products. A lot of small businesses these days have the same requirements as medium-sized enterprises out there. This is where Carrier Operator comes in. We're going to talk about email next. Um, one thing I want to throw in, I actually talked to a pharmacist yesterday about a phone system. He has two pharmacies, and you know, right now he's got a traditional phone system at each one. They have their own phone numbers at each pharmacy. And we were talking about moving to something like VoIP and SIP providers. And the neat thing for him with the two buildings, first, it was going to be called savings. Uh, he's going to really reduce the number of phone lines he has by having two offices. Second, if somebody calls, he could have two phones registered to him. So he could have one at his desk at one pharmacy and one at his desk at the second pharmacy with the same extension number. So if somebody calls a pharmacy and says, hey, can I speak to Chris, and he's not at that pharmacy, they can just transfer it to his extension, and it will ring at both pharmacies. So no matter where he's at, he can answer that call. And that's something he can't do now. Right now, he just has to take a message and he calls them back. So I just wanted to throw that in. We did talk to them yesterday, and I think this will be a really good solution for that customer. All right, so in addition to phone systems, we, have, uh, we also have email solutions. So, um, so email is a common uh, standard in communication nowadays, you know. So, um, so there's a lot of different providers for email right now. And, you know... A lot of people are using Gmail for business and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of different, you know, ways that businesses are hosting email today. So, um, so one of the best ways to um, brand your business is to have an email address. Um, let's hope that uh, you know you own the domain and um, you have your own business name as the email. So, you know, a lot of small businesses are using, you know, um, whatever at gmail.com or what's a good example? Comcast or BBU. Or... Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, all those providers too. So, um, with us, you can actually host your own email solution in the cloud. So, is what that means is we're going to take care of the email for you. You don't have to worry about hosting an exchange server at your office. So, um, there's a lot of overhead having your own email server at your office, so like, you know, the security issue, the hardware, um, all kinds of things like that. Um, you know, with us as a cloud-based provider, you're going to get uh, all your email hosted in the cloud for a monthly fee. Uh, so options for email are... Um, you don't want to be locked into your internet provider 
you know, what if you switch internet providers in the future? So, you know, what if you go with BBU OptiNet? So your email is at BBU.net and you, you know, you decide you're going to switch to Comcast. Well, then your email has to move to, and then, you know, everybody you're talking to <laughs> is also going to have to update their email in their system. So, um, there's that, and like I talked about, um, having an email that comes from your own domain name helps to solidify your brand. So, here at Innovative Computer, we have the domain InnovativeCS.biz. So, all of our emails are, mine's ZHarless at InnovativeCS.biz. Um, so, it's, it's a good thing for brands. Um, and then, uh, on top of that, um, you can sync all your devices together with the cloud. So, uh, like I have a MacBook, uh, my office computer, my phone, and an iPad. So all my email is all synced together, all in one. You don't have to worry about anything like that. Um, other good reasons to uh, move your email to the cloud is, uh, you know, privacy. Um, <laughs> if you're hosting your email with BBU or Comcast, you never know who's going to be. Not saying it could happen, but you know, um, it's not completely <coughs> private. Nor can it be HIPAA compliant, which um, a lot of medical offices require um, HIPAA compliancy nowadays. Um, so you're saying that, for instance, for in house small business info, it could be at bhsbi.com. Exactly. Uh -huh. Instead of at BDU or Comcast mm -hmm. or CenturyLink or Kimberly. Sure. I mean, we deal with that all the time because what happens, like Zach was talking about, just last week I had a customer that had CenturyLink for years and they switched to Comcast because they gave them a great deal. Well, okay, everybody in the world had their CenturyLink email address. So at that point, did they switch to a Comcast email address? You had to pay a little bit extra through Comcast for the email address. And if they ever decided to switch to another provider again, they're gonna go through the same issue again. We're gonna have to try to tell all their contacts that we have a new email. So it makes sense in that situation to go ahead and register a domain name, it doesn't cost a lot of money, and to move to your own private email server. And that way in the future it doesn't matter what internet provider you go with, you get to stick with your own email, you don't have to change it. It's kind of like a separate thing, I mean, a lot of internet service providers charge separate for email, um, or like that, for business email. How is that safer? How is it safer? Yes. As in security? More secure. Alright, so a lot of times, you're on your own, or if you're on your own server, it's completely like private, BBU. secure connection. Like if you go through BBU mm -hmm. or Comcast, if your email is currently going through the one of those suppliers. Right. There's, one, two. there's no like really, you can't really prove that BBU, um, that they're completely encrypted, they can tell you that they are. Well. Um, I mean, another slide in a second, we use uh, a Barracuda solution. Some of you may have heard of Barracuda Networks that encrypts your email. So we use that as an additional layer, but I think we were talking about this this morning really about the data storage. And because in a second, we're talking about having your own private data storage as compared to a Dropbox. But the issue that you kind of bring up, and I think the answer to that is if somebody's going to hack something, if it's a large group that knows how to do it, they're going to hack you know, Comcast, they're going to hack Dropbox, they're going to hack OneDrive, because they're going to get millions of passwords. For them to just find one random IP address that's you know, associated with Virginia Highlands and try to hack that, I mean, yeah, it's possible, but we've got the Barracuda protection, which is going to make it harder, and what do they get out of it? Maybe 20 email accounts, they're going to get the passwords off of it. So in general, the big hacking groups out there, they're going to target the big companies like Comcast, uh, BB, well, maybe not BBU, they probably don't even target that, but Comcast, CenturyLink, they're going to target those big companies where they can really get a lot of passwords. Is this HIPAA compliant? We have that, the Barracuda solution is why we make that HIPAA compliant. It encrypts emails. And it's on another slide, but the way that works, when you send an email to somebody, if you put in the subject line encrypt as a keyword, we can make it anything. It recognizes that when it goes through the mail server and it creates that as an encrypted message so when the person at the other end gets it, it's in a portal that they have to click on and they have to put in a username and a password to access it. At that point, it's logged, you, know, you can verify who opened the file, what IP address it came from, and that makes it a HIPAA compliant solution. So, our solution is also, um, it's by Carrier, which also does the voice over IP, um, the phone solution, the same company. 
So it provides uh, enterprise, enterprise class email, calendars, contacts, tasks, chat, and more. So uh, it's going to have all your. Or if I can like demo, make sure. It's going to have all that in a web interface as well. You can sync it to Outlook. So I'm sure a lot of you all use Outlook. Yeah, Outlook. So it's also going to work with uh, with Outlook to sync all your stuff up. Um, so Karyo Connect is hosted in our data center in Kansas City, Missouri. We have uh, multiple servers there. So that's going to be better than hosting it at your own business. A lot of businesses have an exchange server on site um, that, you know, requires power, an internet connection to it. And then if it goes down, your email's down, and then your connection, you know, your communication is going to be, um, you're not going to have that. So when it's completely cloud-based, it's completely redundant. Nothing, uh, nothing's going to happen. Let's see. All right, so um, with Karyo, you can actually connect your own devices, um, Android, iPhone, iPads, uh, MacBooks, Outlook, like I said. Um, it all syncs up together. Um, end users can, you know, configure your own device without, you know, us having to come in and set it up. So um, you would just get a username and password and a mail server address, and you would connect it to your phone, and your mail would sync right up. Um, Um, so back to the security thing, um, our email is uh, encrypted with a uh, security certificate um, in addition to the Barracuda, antivirus and more. In addition to that we have automated backups so uh, if you delete an email from your email box um, we're actually going to have a backup of that for up to two weeks. So even though it's deleted you can call us if you accidentally deleted it and we will be able to recover it up to two weeks. Um, after that, it's completely gone, but um, it's also another great thing about um, hosting it in the cloud is the backup thing. So, like, if you had it on site or somewhere like that and the building burned down, there's not going to be any data. <laughs> so, if it's in the cloud, it's completely secure. Um, that's just talking about the Barracuda email filter again. Uh, which basically just uh, makes everything HIPAA compliant. Um, secures emails. What does it do when you type encrypt in the subject line? It actually... Yeah, that's the 256-bit encryption. Yeah, so if you type out an email and you type the word encrypt in capital letters in the email, it's actually going to encrypt it. And when the, other, <clears throat> when the person receives it, recipient, um, there's going to be a link there. There's not going to be a body email. There's going to be a link there, and they're going to click that, and it's actually going to open up the content there. So it's completely encrypted, so nobody can uh, can view the content. It's really easy when email is not encrypted. I was just showing Dustin yesterday um, <clears throat> to do a deep packet inspection, which what that means is like I can install a program on here and uh, compromise the network here and actually see every ounce of internet traffic that's going on um, between any of your all's devices. And the only way that I can't see that is an encryption and uh, secu sec security certificate encryption. So what we offer includes that. And that Barracuda thing, it actually, it, it has a lot of features. We commonly use the keyword feature, so if you type encrypt in the email, it encrypts it. But it can actually look at the body of the email, too. And if it sees anything in there that it thinks is a HIPAA issue, like a patient information, anything medical-related, it will encrypt it even if you forget to put the encrypt in the keyword. So, I mean, it's a total HIPAA solution. That's what they designed that for. Mm -hmm. We have a quick video covering um, Karyo Connect, the email client, just to um, cover everything. Hold on. Bad. You know, we use all these different devices to collaborate with each other in email and contacts and calendars. And one of the amazing things that Karyo Connect provides is the ability to do that through any device and keep everything in sync. It's 
an incredibly robust, stable platform that every time will deliver content to whatever device you need. Well, there's no question we live in an increasingly mobile world, and that's really pushing the boundaries of what we can do outside the office. So what we've done with Curio Connect is build a really strong mobile infrastructure so that people can use their iPhones or Blackberries or Android devices to do really cool things like uh, schedule calendar events or send and receive encrypted emails outside the office. I think public folder synchronization on the mobile side is one of the real benefits of Curio Connect. Very few servers allow you to actually see public folders, shared contacts, shared calendars, shared folders, any type of shared folder on a mobile device. You know, I can look at my iPhone and I can see, oh, well, there's a public calendar with all the people who are out today or who are on vacation, all from my phone. One of the amazing benefits of using Connect is when we're not at our desks, regardless of which mobile device we've chosen to use, we're kept up to speed. It's constantly synchronizing and making sure that we have the most up-to-date and accurate information we need to do our jobs better. That's where Carry Connect comes into play. It is the workhorse of your office. So if I'm a Mac guy and I want to talk to somebody who's Windows focused, I can use Outlook 2011 for the Mac or any of the native Apple apps and they can use Outlook for Windows. And we can seamlessly collaborate on contacts, calendars, email, real time, all the time. Carrier Connect can be installed in almost any environment, whether you want to run it virtualized or on a Mac, uh, just about any version of Windows, uh, multiple distributions of Linux, but regardless of the environment or operating system you choose, it has very low system requirements, so you really don't have to worry about allocating a lot of hardware for the product to function properly. From an administrative standpoint, Cario Connect is great because everything is self-contained. Uh, it doesn't rely on this fragile ecosystem of third-party applications or, or other services within the operating system. So you don't have to cross your fingers and pray that nothing goes wrong after you do an upgrade. We have a very easy interface. I think that's really where the goal of Cario is. That's, that's where Cario Connect's power is. So yeah, I, something I picked up on that they mentioned in the video was um, how it can bring together multiple interfaces. So if somebody's using a Mac or if somebody's using um, Outlook for Mac, um, not everybody has to be on the same version. So a company wouldn't have to buy um, the same version of Outlook for everybody. So if there was a mismatch there, you know, people are going to be able to use um, whatever they want. <laughs> So, so is Terahair Connect, is it kind of an intranet as well as internet? Oh, I mean, you could use it that way, but I've never have. I mean, we've always connected it to the outside world with the domain name. But, yeah, yeah I mean, in theory, you could install it just locally and connect with users inside your office. Okay. Yeah. So, Dan, do we have everything we need for this meeting? It's all right here, sir. Is your data backup as reliable as it should be? The water sir, you told me everything. Ours is. Now that is supposed to be a, a funny video, but it does kind of highlight the uh, limitations of, of in-house data management. Um, a couple things we're going to be talking about today. Um, your data is your business, uh, moving your files to the cloud and hosting your own cloud. Uh, by definition, uh, cloud storage is it's a service model in which data is maintained, managed, backed up remotely, and made available to users over the internet. Um, its popularity has increased tremendously over the past few years. Um, many companies that you already use um, offer cloud storage, such as uh, Google Drive, Amazon Cloud Storage, Microsoft OneDrive, and then uh, Dropbox also. Um,
there's several different benefits for uh, cloud storage, especially for businesses. Um, some of it's um, like the, the ability to actually get it for free um, if you stay below a certain um, file size limit. Um, files being able to sync locally to your computer, you can actually install an application on your computer and it sets up um, a drive. So when you save something to that drive, you can go to another computer that you, you also have the application on and the file is already there um, where it's synced remotely. <coughs> another benefit is uh, data protection and automatic backups. If a business experiences some kind of disaster like a fire, a flood or theft or something like that, your, your files are protected off-site so you don't have to worry about data loss. Um, we also have the ability to share data with colleagues and clients. You can have multiple employees in different locations working on, on shared files. Um, this would help as a business to reduce overhead um, because you wouldn't have to necessarily have all the employees in the office so uh, a lot of them can work from home or just basically anywhere that has an internet connection. You can share presentations with your clients and get instant feedback. Just um, like you have working on a, a project for for some company, you can you can share that with them. They can they can access it, go over it, and then tell you what they liked, didn't like about it. Another plus is the ability to save money on file, file server management. A lot of companies um, choose to, to go the, the cloud storage route because maintaining a, a file server is relatively expensive and they do tear up from time to time. So um, if you choose the, the cloud option, you're, you're also saving the money of having to repair it and then um, you don't have the downtime that um, while you're working on it to fix it. To relate that to real world, a couple weeks ago uh, I worked with an attorney locally and he was looking at adding a file server to his office, a small file server, because he was adding some uh, staff and they needed to be able to share files. And after reviewing all the requirements, we actually decided to just go with Microsoft OneDrive, which was one of the options that Robbie presented earlier. That includes, um, it's a lot of times wrapped up in what Microsoft calls Office 365, where you get Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and they give you OneDrive storage. And after talking to this attorney, um, we decided it made sense to not invest $1,000 in a server, a simple file server. I mean, a real file server could be three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000, but this was just for four or five people. But it didn't make sense for him to invest in that, worry about doing backups on it, when he could just use his Office 365 package that he was already paying for, create some folders in the OneDrive, and have all his staff access that from anywhere, because that basically gave him the option to let one of his staff people work from home when they needed to, and they could still access the information. Another option is to, uh, to build your own cloud. If you're concerned about security, uh, but you still need to share files with, uh, with your employees and, and clients, you can create your own cloud storage, um, like they were talking about with the data center earlier. Um, we even um, have our own called the, the ICS own cloud. Um, or, what was it? You could... Uh, Kind of like a Dropbox that's hosted, like, like a, it's not, it's Dropbox, but you host it yourself or somebody hosts it instead of paying Dropbox to do it. Exactly, and this goes back to the point you brought up where we feel like when we say that this could be a more secure option if you're worried about somebody hacking into stuff in the sense that the hackers are probably going to look at Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, and attempt to hack and get access to thousands and thousands of or millions of users' files. Or if you have your own uh, cloud that we sell, that we create, uh, we feel it's a good, good option because uh, it's specific to your business. It would be very rare that a hacking group decided to just attack your business. Even if they did, it has the same security that a Dropbox or Google Drop does. But um, it kind of limits your exposure. You're not going to get involved in an attack. I think somebody was, 
just recently, there was somebody, go to my PC or some company, I just read about the news a couple of weeks ago, where millions of passwords were compromised. Um, I, I think it would be very rare that somebody is going to find one IP address with one company and hold them in their own storage and try to attack that. And this would be like, own cloud is going to be, um, you can make it HIPAA compliant. You're never going to be able to make Dropbox HIPAA well, compliant. Well, they have a professional version of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's recording. But it's, it's more expensive. Way expensive, yeah. So and you can actually brand this as your own, too. So it, it actually looks like uh, it's something that you own when you share it with your colleagues. Instead of, you know, a Dropbox link, it's going to be a link from, you could actually do it on your own domain, just like we were talking about with the email, like a, you know, brand consolidation kind of thing. Here's a video that kind of kind of highlights that. Hi, this is Tim from Sutton and Consulting. I'm glad to show you OwnCloud, a cloud file sharing system. OwnCloud is a program that either installs on your own server or you can have it be hosted off-site if you don't have a server or don't need access to your internal file servers. So what does OwnCloud do? Number one, it is a cloud file storage system. Number two, it keeps your files in sync between your computers. Number three, it gives you access to your company file servers. Number four, it shares files with your co-workers or customers. Number five, it's a cloud that is secure, private, and owned by you. Number six, it is open source, it's free software, there's no licensing ever. And number seven, it gives you access from your iPhone, Android, iPad, PC, or Mac to all of your files. So let's do a demo of own cloud. Log in with your username and password. I'll create a folder. And I'm going to share this folder with John. Choose John. Now I want to move files to it. So I'll go to my desktop and move some of these um, training files in here. It is a rather quick process. Then let's access those shared files. Let's look at the mobile client. Just start it and it'll show you your files. You can scroll up and down. You can refresh, view your files, upload into folders. You can download, you can remove, you can rename folders and files. Here's a look at the settings of the program. You can set a PIN number, you can enable instant uploading, so every time you take a photo it gets uploaded. And you can also set it so that it only sends it when you're on Wi-Fi connection. In the instant upload, it puts them in the instant upload folder so that you can share them with your co-workers, you can view them online, you can delete, and you, it also acts kind of like a backup of your pictures from your phone. Many apps on your phone, such as the gallery, allow you to share files and upload them to different services, own cloud in this instance. Choose the folder you want to put it in, click on the upload button, and there it goes and you can then view the progress of it in the status notifications. <coughs> Here we have archived scans on our file server mapped as the Z drive on my Windows PC. So if I look in there, I double click on that. It shows me all the folders and files that are in there. I also have the same archive here in my own cloud server. I can click on archive, then click on 2005, and there they are, the same files. And I can share those, I can download them, I can view them. File synchronization is another feature of own cloud. You can move some files on the Windows side to the synchronization folder. And these files then will be synchronized to the Mac and to the website. What's the cost associated with that own file? 
Uh, a lot of it's how much space you need. Uh, we have different tiers of gigs, but it starts at like $25 a month for our basic package and goes on up depending on how much space you would need. So when I spoke earlier, I was saying that the fourth, or we were going to talk about four items. The fourth is your applications. We talked about your phone, your email, your files. So now, how do you access your applications in the cloud? If you're having people working from home, different businesses, you want everybody accessing the same apps. The first easiest way is most applications, or some applications now, are introducing themselves as software as a service. The one I use at my company is called QuickBooks Online. A lot of people use that. It used to be a model where you bought QuickBooks, installed it on your desktop, your data was local at your office. They still have that, but they've also introduced QuickBooks Online where it's a web-based application. It works just like QuickBooks on your desktop pretty much, but it's hosted by QuickBooks in the cloud. All your data is in the cloud. And that means I can access it from anywhere. I can log in at my office. I can go home and open my laptop, access it. I don't have to worry about dealing with remote access at my office or sharing files. And we're seeing that a lot with the different uh, industries or businesses we deal with. Uh, we deal with a lot of dental offices, and uh, those companies that they use for software have started introducing cloud-based applications. Dentrix, EagleSoft, they all have cloud-based app apps now. Uh, medically, we deal with a lot of medical offices that have moved to cloud-based applications for HIPAA compliance, really. Uh, these applications, instead of being stored in a, a server in your office, They've moved them to a server in a data center that's HIPAA compliant, it's locked, it's monitored, only certain people have access to it. So a lot of our medical offices are doing that. And there's all kinds of free ones when you look on the internet for customer relationship management, uh, legal stuff, you can find all kinds of free apps that are software as a service. But we also deal with businesses that have legacy applications that maybe the software company doesn't exist anymore or the software company hasn't created uh, an online version but they still want to have people working from home. They don't want to have to deal with VPNs and remote access at their own office. So the way we handle that is something called virtualization. At our data center, the one we use in Kansas City, we have servers and we create virtual machines. So if I had a customer with a Windows 2003 server that was running this old legacy application for a time clock and they really needed to keep it, well, I could take an image of that PC I, they were having downtime, but I would take an image of that PC and I would upload it to one of our servers at our data center and I would launch it as a virtual machine. Now, at their office, they would use something like Microsoft Remote Desktop that's built into Microsoft Windows and they would access this virtual machine. So they would still have access to their legacy application, but they wouldn't need a server at their office anymore and they can access it from anywhere. And the backups happen automatically. We take snapshot backups at our data center. So if something happened to that piece of hardware, we could restore it to another piece of hardware very quickly. And uh, they don't have to worry about doing that at their office. It's kind of like, you know, a lot of times you don't need a big machine to run some applications. So mm -hmm. why a virtual machine is good is because you're taking, it's kind of like you're sharing a big machine and you're splitting it up into little pieces. You're, you're splitting the power up, you know, so the hard drive space, the memory, the CPU, you know, because, you know, not everybody, you know, that's needs uh, an entire, yeah. you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Three, four thousand dollar server. <laughs> it's yeah. funny how fast the hardware has changed in the computer industry. I had a customer last year that had four servers at their office, and they were all running these legacy applications, except for QuickBooks. They had an inventory program. They had a customer relationship program of one. I can't even remember what was on the third. So it was time. These were six years old. It was time to upgrade. So the way we did that is we bought one new server that had plenty of memory, plenty of RAM, and we virtualized those three old servers that they still had to have. So now we took these four big old PCs they had, we just set one box in their office, and it runs virtual copies of these, uh, these three machines on that one. Now we did that inside their office, they didn't want to move it to a data center, but in theory it would have been very easy for us to just copy that to our data center and host it remotely, and then they could access it from anywhere and no one worried about having to back it up or maintain the hardware. So, speaking of all that, we've got to talk about how to keep it all secure. Uh, you know, I said I, I dealt with a nonprofit. Well, security there, I don't think it's that big a deal. We use Dropbox. If one of the computers got a virus on it, some ransomware, I could restore the files through Dropbox. I'm not too concerned there. But, uh, you know, we do have a lot of no offices, medical offices. We've got to think about HIPAA compliance. 
So for businesses like that that want people to work from home or work from a different, or if they have multiple locations, we have to be concerned about the security and make sure that we're compliant with HIPAA for those offices. Uh, the way we do that, and another thing would be users bringing their own device. We see this all the time. Um, I guess as things have changed now, uh, it's common for a business not to buy a laptop for a new employee. Maybe they give them just a little bit of a, a bonus or something to let the person bring their own laptop. So in that scenario, do you take that person's laptop and install all these applications on it, like QuickBooks, Office, set up their email, or do you virtualize it and have them just use one application that's built into their laptop already, Microsoft Remote Desktop, and access the server somewhere? That way, if that employee quits, you just cut off their username and password, they no longer have access anymore, you don't have to access their laptop to uninstall anything, remove any data. Um, Let's see. So, I got a little funny video again here about uh, keeping it all secure and you know, things people are concerned about when stuff moves to the cloud. Um, there are these things called cookies where like, if you go to a site and buy something, it will remember you and then create ads for other stuff you might want to buy. So it learns information about me? Seems like an invasion of privacy. Dude, if you think that's bad, go to Google Earth and type in your address. so many days. Yeah. So for our customers for security is a concern, we offer our ICS Mac <coughs> extension. And uh, that we try to fall under HIPAA compliance with that by, by several key points. First we have a managed antivirus that runs in the cloud. Now with that we log into a central dashboard and our, our customers can too. And they can see all their machines. So if they have 20 employees that are working from different places in the globe, they can see all 20 machines and they can see that the antivirus is up to date. They can see if any of the computers have picked up a virus. We can run reports for specific days to say if a computer had a virus or if the antivirus was up to date. That's crucial if there was ever a HIPAA audit for that customer that we could say that. Also through that same service we can do web filtering. So while these employees are working, uh, we can limit what they're looking at. We can block Facebook. We can always block bad websites. That goes back to the security auditing so that we can tell um, with it, the big one there is like Windows updates and updates to Java, Adobe. We can run reports through this application and we can see what computers are up to date and not up to date. Now, I guess to really pull that together in the cloud, the big issue is you're going to have people working from everywhere. And you want to be able to see that their computers are secure and up to date and could not potentially compromise the business, especially if it's a medical business. And with this software, we can do that. We can also remotely wipe the devices of certain items. So with the cloud storage options like the Karyo Connect for email, if I had an employee that would be terminated and I needed to make sure they didn't have access to our information anymore, I could quickly log into the Karyo Connect server, wipe their device. Now that doesn't wipe everything personal from their device, but it wipes their email. So they no longer have access to our company email or our shared files. And it also gives us opportunity to do secure and encrypted backups. Because even if we're using the cloud, most of these people are probably saving files locally to their computer. In some cases, that just works better for them. So we can offer a way to back those files up. So if that computer crashes, whether it be the employee's own device or a company device, we can recover those files. Have it back up pretty quickly, too. I mean, you're looking at... computer that was very important to an office crashed and we were using our ICS Max back product, backup product, we could launch that system image of that computer as a virtual machine on different hardware. So that's how we usually try to pull offices back up very quickly if they have a major failure like a server or a critical workstation. In a, in a, a lab, in a virus. Yeah, well, like what happens say with Dropbox, OneDrive is um, all that information is synced locally to the computer generally. So if I'm on my laptop and I have the Dropbox for the nonprofit I deal with, and I accidentally open up an email that's a ransomware and it encrypts all my files, it will encrypt what's in the Dropbox folder. The thing about the cloud is all that's backed up. So like with Dropbox, they have a special form you go through on their website and you say, restore all my files as of 10 p.m. last night. So yeah, uh, that virus on that laptop did encrypt everything, but it can be recovered. So our backups are like we keep two-week backups on everybody's machine? 
and then we keep an image every week. So an image is a complete backup of the whole thing, and the files are individual files that we keep. You know, we only back up a file if it's changed. So our backup software, you can be like, okay, I want this file from last Wednesday, and it's going to find it and restore it just like it was last Wednesday. And we keep those up to two weeks. We did a presentation earlier this year about ransomware because we see it everywhere. I don't know if everybody's familiar with ransomware, but it's a new virus that attacks a computer and it encrypts the files. And then the person that wrote the virus demands money to be paid to get the key to decrypt your files. It's amazing that they can't track down these people, but they use something called bitcoins, which apparently makes it untraceable. I don't know how. It's, it's a, a bitcoin, basically. You have an address and a password to that and your name is not tied to it whatsoever. And there are transaction companies that can convert Bitcoins to US dollars and vice versa. So you get that wallet address and password, and that's it. There's no name tied to it or anything. Uh, it's just a currency used for malicious purposes, but there are some good ones. You know, yeah. So. yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is a currency that I guess some legal companies use, but not very often. A guy that graduated high school um, two years ahead of me um, he started going to the University of Virginia and got an offer from a Bitcoin transactor uh, that converts the U.S. dollars to Bitcoins in Atlanta, making you know, at least six figures. <laughs> uh, dropped out of UVA to go work for Bitcoin. So, you know. yeah. And most of these are overseas, the, the hackers are, so it makes it very hard to trace. But the, the deal with that is, and like the backup products that we use and you should use, is that you retain multiple versions of files. We had a scenario once at a medical office uh, before Labor Day one year. Uh, a practitioner there on like a Friday afternoon got a ransomware virus, encrypted a bunch of stuff on their server. Well, they were out Saturday, Sunday, Monday. They come back Tuesday and realize that they can't open a bunch of pictures of their patients. They can't access all these files because they've been encrypted. Well, the backups had run each day. The local backups that they had set up prior to us had overwritten themselves. So by the time Tuesday rolled around, all the files on their local backup were encrypted too. But luckily we had a backup program online that offered retention, so I could go back in that two week period like Zach was talking back, I could go back five days and say I want to restore those files. And we were back in business after they all downloaded again. But two weeks isn't a maximum, I mean, depending on what you want, we can keep them for as long as you want. You know? Yeah, and we can even create cycles like a, a monthly retention where it keeps two weeks and then it keeps every month too. programs will encrypt every device connected to it. So yeah, if you if you've run a backup to a memory stick or to a hard drive and you've unplugged it and put it in a safe place, then certainly we could fix your computer and then you could restore those files. If that external hard drive or memory stick was connected to your computer at the time of the attack, everything on that's going to be encrypted too. Okay. The next one is the cloud. Well, it's a, it's a piece of equipment sitting somewhere. Mm -hmm. okay, so you take any your information that go through the wire or through the air, which one? Either. The internet. Yeah, I mean, yeah. going through the internet. So the equipment you talk about is usually located in a data center somewhere. The one we use is in Kansas City. So it's a big building with hundreds and hundreds of racks of servers. Uh, the neat thing about having it at a data center for us is they have multiple enterprise class carriers coming in. So they have fiber optic connections from AT&T, the big names, Quest, not like local Comcast and stuff. So there's redundancy there that they have built in. If one of those fiber connections was cut, then there's redundancy to still access the files in your, your server, your data center. Connection speed is like you can't get it. Yeah, it's usually a hundred your house or business connection. You know? So it's much, much past what you would get at a local business. You would have, uh, you chose not Automatic, it's going to be. It's going to back up your files automatically to that. No. no. So, whatever files 
files you have on your computer that the computer stores, that's on your computer and not anywhere else. Right, if you're not subscribed to a backup program, then right. Okay. Um, There's so many options there. Uh, the domain names are cheap. You can go online and buy a domain name for ten dollars a year, usually. And then you do have to tie that with a company that hosts email. So there's companies on the internet like GoDaddy, HostGator. They host a, a simple Hop3, that's what I call it, email service. And you could get that pretty cheap, maybe hundred dollars a year. So you could get your own domain name and hosting of simple email for hundred, hundred ten bucks a year. What we offer is something more like a server-based email. We charge five dollars a mailbox for these accounts, six dollars if it includes the Barracuda encryption. And with that, um, with the server-based email, it's true synchronization. Your, your mailbox is actually stored on the server. All your devices connect to that server and download the data. So everything stays in sync. If, if something happened to one of your devices, then you just set up a new computer and download your mailbox again. You don't lose anything. Delete something from your laptop, it deletes it from your phone. You add a calendar entry on your phone, it shows up on your laptop. That's server based email. So that's that's your options. You can go like a POP3 account with a GoDaddy, or you can go to a server based email system. But POP3, the disadvantage to that is I mean, if you have multiple devices, if I pull an email from my iPad, it's going to disappear from my MacBook. Yeah. So it's not going to be able to come through on my MacBook. Whereas option if, one or option two is you download copies of the messages to every device and you delete them, you know, you spend 10 minutes one morning deleting all the spam from your MacBook and then you turn on your iPhone and you still have all the spam on your iPhone because it's not synchronized with a POP3. Okay. That wasn't bad. Was that all the questions? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Guys like this are in business because I understood about half of what they were talking about. But I always learned something. So thank you so much You're welcome. for thank doing you for the presentation me. today. We appreciate you. And their contact information is here on the screen. I'm sure they have business cards we have business card. that we're gonna we're gonna ask somebody to pass out while they're here. Next week, Our new knowledge is going to be how to lead a happy team. The group from Sonority uh, Group in Nashville, Tennessee are coming up to do this class. This proves to be, or promises to be a very good and interactive class. The October 26th, creating a PR strategy. November the 2nd, online marketing. And on November the 17th, we're going to have an Entrepreneur Express, and this is in uh, lieu of uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week. And so this is going to be our contribution to um, uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week, and this will be the kickoff of our fourth annual Business Plan Challenge Contest. So. Um, thank you all for coming, and please remember that we're here every Wednesday with something uh, something for everyone. So thanks again, and thanks to the guys from Innovative Technologies.